Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. There's a bunch of things we love to talk about. Family, numbers, and how about a top 10 list? Well, let's put them all together. Let's talk about the top 10 greatest number 30s in NFL history with Jeremy McFarland of the Football's Family. He's coming up right after this. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. This is your host, Darren Hayes, and we're podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron, one day at a time. So with Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff supplying us with the tunes, let's go no huddle through today's football history headlines. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com, and we continue our Football by Numbers series in this episode. In this edition, we are bringing the mention of the best NFL players that wore the number 30. And we have a guest today, and he's a good friend of the program, none other than my fellow Sports History Network partner, Jeremy McFarlane from the Football's Family Podcast. Jeremy McFarlane, welcome back to the Pigpen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren, for having me back. Well, we are sure glad you could join us. And Jeremy, we talked uh, a lot uh, or a little bit about uh, your podcast last time, what it's all about and everything. Uh, but that name, Football is Family, that is such an interesting name. I, I love the name of it. But was there a reason uh, for the naming the podcast that? Yeah, there was a, there was a commercial about uh, four years ago that when the NFL started the season up, where they played a song by the, I believe it was the Magnificent Nine, or I, I cannot think of the group's name right off the top of my head, but uh, it was called I'm Going Home. And they had a bunch of people driving in their cars or riding their cars going to games. And as they were doing that, it basically gave this image of football being family. And, you know, with all the stuff that people do to get ready for the games and the, the habits they have. And, I just, I, I just thought, you know what? That's what football is all about. It's, it's about tradition. It's about all these things. And, you know, I just thought, well, I wanted people to tell the story. So football's family came up in my head and, and luckily it stuck. Yeah. I mean, you really identify that theme time and time again. Uh, I mean, I know like your earlier podcast where you're bringing people from representing, you know, many of the teams I, I got to represent the Steelers on one of your programs, but just, uh, you know, I, I love how you bring that family theme home almost every podcast you do. And it's, it's just a great thing. I love the theme of it. Well, thank you. It's Edward Sharp and the magnet and the magnetic zeros. That's who it was. Uh-huh. I knew I got the name wrong. That's now, the now I know why you didn't remember the name. That's a pretty complicated name for a singing group there. Well, for a Southern guy like me, anything more than one or two syllables is a little bit much for <laughs> me, at least. I think it's just an age thing, you know, because I, no, I feel too. it. I feel it. <laughs> that too. Well, we have a tall task tonight. We have the greatest number 30s in NFL history. We have 101 years to choose from all the people that wore the number 30 that played the game. And where we always start, Jeremy, is we have the Pro Football Hall of Fame sort of gives us a clue of some people that they have identified that's in the hall in Canton, Ohio, that were the number 30. And tonight, I'm just going to mention their names real quickly. We can come back and talk about them in greater detail here in a minute. Uh, but it's Terrell Davis. Ollie Matson, Bill Willis, Clark Hinkle, and I'm going to probably mess up his last name, Alex Wojciechowicz. I, I think I got it right there. Hopefully I didn't butcher it. Wojciechowski. Wojciechowski. Okay. The only reason I know that is on Monsters Inc. It was Mike Wojciechowski or Mike Wojciechowski or something like that. And it just kind of goes along with that. 
Okay. Okay. So I did butcher. <laughs> I, I'm not good with those long. There's too many uh, letters in that name. Wojinkowski so, or Woj, we just call him Al- Alex. Alex W. That? Alex W. <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't know if you want to start. If we want to start by talking about these uh, fine gentlemen, these five. Well, this past week, and by the way, I just listened to your um, to your podcast, uh, being on the history of of uh, college football. I listened to that just a little bit ago, and I want to give you a kudos for that. That was that was a great job. I liked it. Oh, thank you, thank you. And we'll get to get to one of those players that you mentioned in a little bit, but I want to get to the first one on my list. And uh, this is a special one for me. My last episode of Football's Family, I talked about my fandom of of the Broncos, which nearly ended on April 2009. But from 87 till then, I was just a diehard Broncos fan because that was pretty much the only team that I followed or could follow until the Titans came uh, to Nashville. And uh, one jersey that I still own is the number 30 Terrell Davis jersey. I, I still have it. I, I got it for Christmas one year from a member of the church I attended. She knew I was a Broncos fan, and she found it. I don't know how she did it, but she found it. Um, Terrell Davis holds a special place in my heart because, number one, uh, he gave my Broncos two Super Bowls. I don't think they would have won it without him. No, I, I don't think they would have. In fact, I think in Super Bowl 32, he was the MVP. Yes, he was. Yes. The next year it was Elway. Uh, Davis was the heart and soul of that team. But another reason why I like him a lot is uh, I didn't know what was going on. I was in college in uh, 97, 98, 99, 2000 in that area. And I started getting dizzy spells, Darren. I mean, it was bad. It was bad. I, I thought I was going to pass out. And they, I got uh, diagnosed with migraines. And mm-hmm. over the years, it's gotten worse. But I was like, you know what? People don't understand what migraines. Well, guess what D- Trail Davis had in Super Bowl 32? Had the migraines, he had a migraine yeah. that, that caused him to miss most of the second quarter. And he has become... Uh, an advocate for people with migraines because people look at him and say, you know what? People didn't think this was real. And now because of Terrell Davis, which he's a good guy, uh, you know, a good, good, solid character guy for what I understand about it. He is a, an advocate for that. And I appreciate that part. Now, now I don't remember now his, he had a shortened career. I mean, running backs don't have a long career anyway, but he had seven years, but four of them were just, you know, he was lights yes. out for his first four years. And those last now, three years, he really suffered. I, I know it was some kind of an injury. Was it the migraine that was, uh, he got, uh, his knee got just shredded. Uh, he was the main, well, let me, let me talk about this. Terrell Davis is my generation, your generation's Gail Sayers. Um, and this is what, when people are talking in, in my circle, I listen to, you know, uh, Derrick Henry, Derrick Henry has the same type of stats coming out like Terrell Davis did from not from, uh, let me see if I got this right here, Darren, from 95 to 98, listen to the yards here, 1117, seven touchdowns, 1538, 13 touchdowns, 1750, 15 touchdowns. And the kicker. 2008 with, I believe I have 24 touch or 21 touchdowns. That's correct. That is four years. And you say, well, he didn't play very long. He didn't. He only had 7,600 yards total, average 4.6 yards a carry, which is amazing. But you don't really take into consideration a, a career like Trail Davis or Gail Sayers. You don't. You take in where they dominant for a short period of time. And for four years, he was pretty much the goat at that yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that 7,600 yards, uh, 6,500 of it was in those first four years. I mean, that's that's an unbelievable number. There's not too many people who say, hey, I had uh, you know, 6,500 yards in the NFL in four years. Well, not, not the people, people I've been looking up today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but one of the coolest things he did was after he won the Super Bowl, he uh, appeared on Sesame Street. So I give him that, too. Well, right. Yeah, he I mean, he was just a tremendous back. And I can uh, remember he was really setting the, the league on fire for those four years and it really sort of rejuvenated Mr. Elway a little bit, too, near the end of his career. I think he uh, 
he liked having that. He wasn't the whole offense, you know, he had, could turn around, hand the ball off at uh, somebody that could really uh, make some plays happen. And that's uh, really what uh, Terrell Davis did in that offense, really opened it up for uh, Elway even. In, in the 80s, Elway was a one-man band and made it to three Super Bowls. How many did he win? None. None. But right. once they got once they got Terrell Davis, and Shannon Sharp, and Rod Smith, and then they started getting Neil Smith and men like that on the defense, it was lights out. For two years, they were the best team in the NFL. Absolutely. They sure were. So yeah, I, I think uh Terrell Davis is you know definitely, I think uh he's an automatic to put on our, our list of our top ten, I think, right now, because absolutely he's that special of a player. Now let's uh, talk about, we have four other hall of famers. Um, now how about Ollie Matson? Uh, I know we've talked a little bit with uh, Joe Ziemba. We had a, a big trade a few weeks ago. We talked about on uh, the pigskin dispatch. We brought Joe Ziemba on where Ollie Matson was traded for, I think it was like 11 players uh, to the Rams. It was, it was the, it was that time frames uh, Dallas Cowboy, Minnesota Viking type trade. Right. Right. Yeah, it was, I have here, uh, and I'm trying to. I, my mind went blank on the years, but 5,173 yards total uh, rushing, which in any in any generation, that's pretty solid. And I think he was pretty much that team for a few years. I mean, he was pretty much made up that team for a few years with what he could do. Yes, that's that's correct. I mean, especially when he was with the Chicago Cardinals. Yes. That's why we brought Joe Ziembaum because the first uh, six years, he was a Chicago Cardinal, got traded to the Rams, played with them for four years, and then had some stints, uh, three years with Philadelphia and one with uh, Detroit in, at the end of his career. But uh, his most damage in the league was definitely as a Chicago Cardinal. He um, that, that, to me, when I, when I look at stats like that, I – uh, I have it that he played 171 games uh, as a running back. That's a lot of wear and tear, and yet he still was considered worth trading that many people for. Yeah. Tells you yeah. how good he was. That's that's definitely right. And that's back in an era where the passing game wasn't as prevalent as is today. You know, I'm not sure what the percentage right. was, but I'm sure it was a great, you know, probably at least two thirds of a, a team's offensive plays was running the ball back then in the uh, late fifties and uh, early sixties. I don't know how the exact stats on that, but that's uh, I'm sure that's what it was. Uh, yeah. But one thing about Ollie Matson making our list is he only wore the number 30 for one season. That's in 1963. That's what I have. So, I mean, that doesn't mean he's not on the list, but I don't, I can't say I can put him on that list right now with only one season wearing the 30. Well, I'll tell you what, he can wear whatever he wanted to for me, you know? Well, how about if we put him as a standby check and we'll come back to him uh, at the end, maybe we'll come back and uh, you can convince me then. I'm not fully convinced yet. Um, Another great player from uh, almost the same era, who played, well, I guess he played a little bit before Matson, was Bill Willis, uh, Hall of Famer, uh, three times in a Pro Bowl, three times as an All Pro, uh, NFL Championship, and four time AAFC champion. Now, I don't have too much, too many stats for him. Um, I have that he played uh, guard. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Cleveland Browns. Back when they, oh, good gracious. Yes, yes. So he would have been blocking for um, Otto Graham. I, I, thumbs up right there. Right, right. And uh, I think he missed out on Jim Brown. I don't think Jim Brown was there in 53. That was his last season with the Browns. Uh, where he just maybe Brown might have been his first year, but you know that AAFC run. They, I mean, they they won every single championship in the AAFC for the four years, and then came in the NFL, lost in a championship game, and I think the next year they won the NFL championship game. So quite a run for the Cleveland Browns. And this this shows you um, how well the Cleveland Browns adapted to situations when it comes to players. Uh, they probably went – not too many teams probably gave Bill Willis a chance, but the Browns did, and look what they got. They got a Hall of Famer out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, he that, – That to me, when I when I start – you know, being part of this History Network has – you know, I've read a lot before, but now it's opened my eyes to show how 
how people understand it's not the color of skin. It's who you are and what you can do for the team. And when you're in the huddle, it doesn't matter who you are. You're part of that team. And that, that to me, uh, that's an example that we should look at today more so than ever. You're absolutely right. You know, there's a interesting thing about the, uh, his numbers. Okay. He was number 30 for his uh, first eight years in the league or eight years of pro football. And the last two years he had to change the number 60 and uh, wondering, I, I know the, the answer, but do you know why he had to change that number to 60 in 1952? I will in a second. When you tell me <laughs> he, that was when the AFC had a different numbering system, in the NFL. So they, they merged uh, the three teams from the AFC, which were the Browns, the 49ers and the, the Colts. They brought them in the NFL. They were still allowed to wear their old number. So, uh, you know, as a guard, you had, you uh, uh, Mr. Willis wearing number 30, but got became kind of confusing. So the NFL be right before the 1952 season put their numbering requirements that are sort of the precedent of what we have today, where the interior linemen have to wear a 50 through 79 uh, and, you know, backs have to wear certain numbers. You know, I think it's uh, the twenties to the forties uh, wide receivers back then had to wear eighties since then, you know, just a few years ago, they opened it up so they could wear some of the teens and the lower numbers. Uh, but that's when that rule really came into effect for interior linemen had to wear uh, 50 through 79. That would have been weird to see an offensive lineman with a 30 on. Yeah, I think so. And that's, that's what they said there. I was reading about it. There's a lot of confusion for the, the previous NFL teams. Cause they, you know, they really didn't know, you know, guy wearing number 30, you don't know if he's going to go out for a pass or you know, so there's some uh, uh, pass eligibility rules there with the numbers that, that are helpful. I know as now, an official, it's real helpful. <laughs> now I'm looking at his size. They had him listed at 6'2", 213 pounds, which would have been today would have been a safety or a cornerback. Right. Um, and if I remember correctly, how uh, the Browns ran their offense is a lot of pulling. So having a, a, an offense offensive guard that size might not have been a bad thing. Yeah, maybe probably wasn't, but probably he was probably uh, pretty tall for a guard back then, you know, six foot two, you know, I'm sure your quarterbacks weren't the size they are today. So, you know, the passing game, Otto Graham, I'm not sure how tall he was, but uh, I wonder if that was a, a problem for him ever looking over, you know, somebody six foot two in front of him. Well, just talk to Drew Brees. I'm sure it's now Otto Graham was six one. Oh, was he? Okay. He was not. According to Pro Football Reference, <laughs> which is uh, a great a great uh, website, by the way, absolutely is. I get a lot of my stats from there. So, but okay. now Bill Willis deserves to be on that list because of All right. uh, just the fact that he is the man. I agree with you, and he had that number thirty for six seasons. So, absolutely. So, what do we got? We got Trail Davis as Trail a must. Terrell Davis and Willis are on our list for sure. All right. We have Ollie Matson as a comeback to guy. Okay. Uh, might as well stay on the Hall of Famers. How about Clark Hinkle? Let me see if I could figure out where I put him on this on this paper. I and I can't of, read my writing, so you might want to go I'll ahead. Give you and do a little that bit of background on him. He was a you know a two way player. Uh, played from for the Green Bay Packers his entire career, 1932 to 1941. So back in that era of a single platoon, uh, he played uh, fullback, linebacker, halfback, defensive back. So he's a Mr. Everything uh, then. So as a running back, he uh, had 3,860 yards, 3.3 yards per carry average, 35 touchdowns. Not too shabby. Uh, no, I don't, not at all. I don't have uh, too many of his, I don't have any of his defensive stats because they really didn't keep track of him back in those days. But, uh, you know, everything I've read about him, he was a pretty fearsome uh, opponent to go up against because he was a good well, tackler. And uh, that, that is when, uh, if I remember correctly, Dodd, Hunts, Dodd Hudson would have been around that same time. So having that type of rushing yards with a receiver like Dodd Hudson is pretty impressive. Right, right. So yeah. I'll tell you what. Uh, and, and the Packers of the 30s and 40s were not too shabby either. No, I mean, you had Curly Lambeau as your your coach. I think he might have been a player coach at that point in time, too. Um, and they were the, they were the smallest uh, team in the whole uh, NFL, which I think they are now, too, the smallest market. 
but it was yes. even more effective back then because you know you didn't uh, have the uh, funds spread out across the league. You each team was sort of their own uh, funding and what players they could get. That's why uh, Chicago and uh, New York dominated so much. But uh, yeah, Clark Clark Hinkle definitely a good player. Um, we're that that number for uh, a few seasons too. Uh, we're for nine seasons in number thirty. So. I'm going to say, you know, probably just what I read about him. We don't have a lot of stats on him, but I, I think he probably deserves to go on that list too. Well, when we, we take into consideration the time he played with the touchdowns, he said he has 35 rushing touchdowns and um, nine receiving. So that's pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So I am. All right. Quick... I, can, I can see him in there. Okay. So we have three spots of our 10 taken. And we're going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of defensive backs and running back heavy on this. Number. Oh yeah. That's a big number for that. But before we get to that, we have one more hall of famer and he's another lineman, another two way player. And that's our famous Alex W, which I don't want to butcher his name again, but uh, you know, Alex is another great player. Uh, Detroit lions for most of his career, nine years with the lions, five with the Philadelphia Eagles near the end of his career played from 1938 to 1950 in that era. So no, it's like, his now, what, what gets me about this is they have him listed with 19 interceptions considering the 38 to 50 with passing is not as prevalent as it is now. That is really, really good from a linebacker on defense too. That's, Absolutely. That's really I would love to see, of course, I don't think they have, have the stats, but I would love to see how they break it down now for the defensive backs back then, you know, the, the, how many times they have been, uh, you know, targeted and how many passes defended. Cause you know, if you think about it, 19 interceptions, you know, well, that's not much now, but then that could be, that could have led the league. Who, Who knows, you know? Yeah. Right. I mean, one year he, 1944, I mean, 1944 for Detroit, he had seven interceptions at the linebacker position that had to lead would lead linebackers of today. You know, I mean, how many linebackers have seven interceptions in a, a season in a, you know, 16 game season. <laughs> Not, I don't again, think he is any. listed at 5'11, 217 pounds. So that would consider that rangy. Yeah, he had the ability to go inside, go outside. That's 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 impressive too. I tell you what, I I'm loving what, seeing these older players come up on our list and to see how they adapted to the game that they had. Right, right. <laughs> you know, you, you sit there and you think about all the interceptions. If you look at those Detroit teams from the '40s and '50s and the players uh, that were on them, you know, Dick LeBeau. Uh, night train lane. Um, and there, there's a couple other defensive backs I'm forgetting about. I mean, the amount of interceptions that that secondary had for Detroit back then in an era where they didn't pass that much, it's unbelievable. You know, that had to be kind of scary for quarterbacks. Well, that that had to deal with Alex Karras, and I'm, I bet you they were trying to get the ball out pretty fast. <laughs> Probably. Now, I, w- I want to tell you a story about. Um, I had the chance a few years ago when I lived down in Alabama to call in to the Alabama uh, show, uh, the, the post-game show after another Alabama uh, Crimson Tide win, and I had the chance to talk to Kenny Stabler. Wow. And we, You know, I was like, Kenny Stabler and I are just buddy buddies, right? No, I, I had the chance, and I asked him, I said, Mr. Taylor, can you tell me, can you – if you were to go back in time when you were playing court, uh, college, can your team play – in modern time and he said uh no i was about 180 pounds and i would be cut in half by some of these linemen that come up at 350 pounds he said we wouldn't do it um some of these players that i'm looking at like a bill willis probably could play in modern time but he wouldn't play guard right they would yeah. have him uh, – they would probably have him as, a, as an outside linebacker or, or a safety. Um, could Wojciechowski – and, again, if I butcher it, could he play now? I don't know. I would love to see. I would love to see uh, how modern-day games would, would – would, and, and the games back then go – see if they go hand-in-hand. Hand. I would love to see that. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to to say because now, I mean, I don't think it was so much back then. You had a lot of players back then were you know three part or three sport athletes. You know, a lot of them, you know, they played the baseball, basketball, football. Uh, some played ice hockey. Uh, but now it's almost like a specialized thing. When you sort of are a freshman in high school, you're sort of uh, it's it's rare to have multi sport athletes. I think in, in this day and age, as it was as prevalent as it was before. So you have uh, you know football players now. They're they're training for football all year long. They're eating towards and their nutrition's towards football, whatever position they are. You know, if you're a lineman, you're you're eating a lot of carbs, you're lifting a lot of weights, a lot of protein, and you're trying to gain weight to, to be a football player now. And I don't think that was the case. The the sciences and the uh dietary uh you know gurus weren't around then as we have now. And I think uh, that's a big advantage for athletes today. Oh, absolutely it is. So, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Alex would have, if he would have had the same training we have now, he might've been a bigger person playing that position. You know, who knows? It's a two-time champion. That's, that's not, uh, that's not too shabby either. No, no. So what do you think? Should he be on the list or do you want to come back to him? I, I tell you what, we, we, we just have to see his name on the back of a Jersey. I, that's all I want to see is his name on the back of Jersey. He could be the ball boy for all I care, but he has to be there on the field just to see his name on the Jersey. Okay. And just to hear Joe Buck or, or Troy Aikman try to pronounce his name. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, let, how about we put him as a standby? Cause he wore the, he wore the number for three seasons. Let's make sure we don't have somebody else. that's we wore it for a longer period of time that were more significant as a number 30. I could do that. Uh, but we'll come back to him just like we will with uh, Ollie Matson. So that is our five Hall of Famers. We put three of them on the, the top 10 list already. <clears throat> and uh, like you said, we have a lot of DBs and a lot of running backs to, to talk about, uh, be under consideration. And I'll let you uh, start where you want to go with our next. Uh, well, I've got two right off the top of my head that I want to do. And one of them in particular, I, I, I alluded to it earlier. Uh, I don't think he is going to be on our list, but he deserves an honorable mention. He will be the coin flipper of the game that we're going to play with him, and that's James <laughs> Conner. Okay. Um, and the reason why he is out there is, number one, he's a he's a monster. He's awesome, number one. And I'm saying that because even though he's a stealer, he's an inspiration because he's a cancer survivor. Yeah, and I don't absolutely. care how – I don't care how – or what team you play on – that to me is very impressive. And I have a great deal of respect for that. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of his because he came from Erie, Pennsylvania, where I live. As a matter of fact, he came from the school district that I, I live in. He was a McDowell Trojan here in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, I actually, I officiated his games uh, through his whole high school and below. So I, I'm very aware of uh, Mr. Connor and, you know, played right down the road and, you know, in Pittsburgh, you know, Pitt university and uh, has a stealer for his first four seasons in the NFL. And I'm kind of sad that uh, he might not be back this year with the Steelers. But oh, this gotta, salary cap has gotten everybody up. Upset. Yeah. But he, he does, he just has an excellent story. Uh, he was, he was just a, I mean, I can remember he was a good player. I was, I was a referee, so I was always in the offensive backfield. And you get to talk to the players a little bit, especially the skilled players, the running backs, the quarterbacks a little bit, you know, when there's timeouts or something going on before the game. And he was always such a polite kid. He was a big kid, you know, back then. He towered above uh, all his teammates and opponents. Uh, but he was just a, you know, a powerful back, the, the thumper. They had a, a one-two punch at McDowell when he was a senior. And uh, great, great person. I, I enjoyed the, the few times I spoke with him. I remember him, but he was, he was a great, great uh, person as well as a good football player. Well, see, when I heard you on the, uh, the podcast today, I was like, you know what? We're going to be mentioning him tonight. So that's, that's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. But he is definitely going to be out there. He is our inspirational leader. I, I agree. I agree. I'm not sure he makes the list like you say, but maybe, maybe someday he will because he's still got a lot of play left in him. Uh, well, they're not – the running backs are devalued. He is a guy that could go – could start on any team to me other than the Titans. He just can't start for the Titans. But 
not because he he's not a good guy, just because we have the best in the league. So I'm just I'm just saying. But I do have one that I want to bring up, and okay. one that I think is borderline Hall of Fame. All right, and that is Amon Green. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. uh, I, I remember watching him play, and I was very impressed. In 148 games, 9,205 yards and 60 touchdowns. Now, again, I say borderline. Will he ever make it? Probably not. But that's a guy there that if I remember watching him as many times as I've seen the Packers play, uh, he was always a guy that would get into little holes and then burst out and go for it. I, I just – Amon Green is one of my favorite players to watch. You know, when I was doing the research and I saw his name on there, you know, I looked at his numbers. His numbers kind of surprised me. I didn't realize he had, you know, 9,200 yards rushing and 60 touchdowns. He was a sort of, I mean, I remember hearing his name quite a bit. It's not like I watched, got to watch every Packers game where I live, but I watched, you know, enough of them. But I, I just didn't realize he had that many yards. Uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty significant. And he played a long time too. He, he You know, that's, uh, they have him listed as 148 games and uh, carries over 2,000 carries in his career. So that's a lot of pounding, and he he did all right. He pulled out. Uh, I remember him playing for the for the Seahawks, but the big thing is when he came on to the Packers and uh, trying to see. I don't think he won a Super Bowl with them, but he made the Pro Bowl four times as a uh, running back for the Packers, and that's when they had. Far thrown the ball all over the place, so there you go. Right, yeah, he uh, he, yeah, he really really surprised me with his numbers on there. I I didn't expect that, but you know he's he's definitely. I think he's one of the top ten. I think I would put him on the list right now. Oh, I would too. Yards. There's nobody else that has that many much yardage as a running back position. Not to be a oh, spoiler, I would too. he but... would be he would be. Uh, Number four on that list, if I, if, if correct, uh, if we're going to go with it. Yep, I, I think he's a number. He's our number four on that list. All right. Okay. Uh, who else would you like to talk about? Or you want me to take one? Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. This is your show. I'm just All taking right. it over. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd like to talk about uh, Lawrence McCutcheon because he's an interesting, uh, another interesting running back. Uh, he had. Uh, 6,578 yards, 26 touchdowns. He played from 1972 to 1981. Uh, eight of those years was with the Rams. That's who he came in the league with. And then he had one year stints with Buffalo, Denver, and Seattle. But I can remember McCutcheon being pretty significant. And he had uh, four seasons over a thousand yards. Another one where he was 900 yards. Um, he was a five time pro bowler. And he wore that number 30 for, uh, uh, I forget what I had on there, for nine seasons. So, I mean, I think he was pretty significant as a as running backs go. You know, only 6,500 yards, but a 4.3 yards per carry. Uh, that's, that's nothing to shake a stick at. 4.3 yards, if you think about that, if you average that in a year, there's you a first down. Right. Every three plays. Right. Can't you're getting him. hit as soon as you leave the 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 offensive line. You're getting hit by the defense four or five times. Four point three yards is is great, especially when you're a multi year thousand yard rusher. You know, back in that era, you know, you had to have defenses watching you. You know, that he's going to get the ball, and uh, you take a pounding, and you still get that four point three yard average. That's pretty good. Yes, it is. So I'm not convinced that he's on that list yet, but I just wanted to mention him because I think he is definitely significant. Oh, I agree. I agree. Um, 26 touchdowns in that time frame too, when they started to open up the offense with throwing and uh, the Rams were a throwing team at times. Believe if I look at it correctly, he played in a Super Bowl against the Steelers. Was yes. he a part of that Rams team? I with believe Vince so. Ferragamo? I believe so. I believe he was on that. It was yes, 1979. Yes. Yeah. Just like saying that name, Vince Ferragamo. Yeah. <laughs> it's like an action hero. That was, that was quite uh, Do you remember that Super Bowl? That was, that was quite a buildup for a Super Bowl. I remember. I, actually, I was born in 79. I don't have okay. any memories of that. And I'm kind of glad I don't. 
Well, they, they <laughs> built it up because the Steelers had already won three Super Bowls in the last uh, five years prior or six years prior. I think it was. And they built it up of Tinsel Town versus the Steel Town. That's that was what all the papers were, were writing before that Super Bowl, the weeks building up to it. So it's kind of an interesting uh, Tinsel Town versus Steel Town. Yeah. Hmm. So it was interesting. It was a good Super Bowl, too, because actually the Rams were leading. They came back and were winning that game in the fourth quarter, and the Steelers had to put on a little bit of a offensive show at the end to uh, pull away from the Rams, get the lead back and pull away. So Ferragamo played well. Now, uh, I think another player I'd like to bring up, though, for number 30s is uh, Bill Brown, another running back. Boom, boom, brown. Boom, boom, brown. Now, Came- you remember He Hate Me? I think his name was Rod Smart from the XFL. Is that who did the He Hate Me? I, okay. I want to say it is. And if I'm wrong, you know, you can just give, you can send Darren the comments. But <laughs> uh, he put He Hate Me on the back of his jersey. If we pick Bill Brown, he cannot use brown. He has to use boom, boom on the back of his jersey. <laughs> okay. That's- All right. But uh, yeah, uh, boom boom came in the league 1961 with the bears and then played the rest of his career which ended up being 14 seasons total 13 of those were with the minnesota vikings and a real nice career he had uh 5838 yards 52 touchdowns uh 3.5 yards per carry not not a bad career well you're talking about the 60s the 70s minnesota vikings that's super bowl era yeah. Yeah, I tell you what. Uh I guess the 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 Bears didn't need another running back. They had a they were gonna get a good one pretty soon. Right. Uh I'm looking here, he had in one year, let's see. He rushed 251 times and that led the league in 1966. Right. You know, boom boom probably he might deserve to be looked at. Yeah, he, he's interesting. And he was listed as a fullback for most of his career. Now, back in that era, you know, Franco Harris was also a fullback, but they, uh, you know, a few years later, but the fullbacks carry the ball a lot more than they do today. They aren't just that blocking back. Uh, you know, sometimes fullbacks were the bell cow. And I think uh, Boom Boom might have been uh, the bell cow for some of his seasons. But I'd that. say let's give him a second look. Okay. Uh, we'll put him on our, our list to come back to. Uh, okay. You, why don't you go ahead and go next? Well, let's, let's go deep into that list that you sent me, because I think if I looked at it correctly, there was one. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Brian Mitchell. Mm-hmm. This is way down the list. Right. But, you know, everybody knows Dante Hall. And um, my mind went blank. Number 23, I, I just listened to yours. Uh, Devin Hester. Right. Everybody knows them. But the fact is, they wouldn't have been who they were if it wasn't for the fact that Brian Mitchell was there first. Brian right. Mitchell was listed as a he, – he played part running back, part receiver. But the fact is, he was a kick return and punt return master. What I have right here. 463 punt return for 4,599 yards and nine touchdowns. But the kick return is what gets me there. And this right here, if you want to see how you win games, you flip the fill. 607 kick return for 14,014 yards, four touchdowns with a 101 long return. Yeah. That is is how you flip a field. Absolutely. I mean, just think about those averages you just said. If my math is right, he averaged over 10 yards of punt return and over 20 yards per kick return. I mean, now, punt both... returning is hard. Absolutely. Because they're getting, they're getting a running start at you. You're not going to get too many broken tackles. You're just not. But that kick return, if you get the ball at the 10 yard line or, or 15 yard line, you're almost halfway to the, to, you're almost to the 50 with 20 yards. That's that helps a, an offense about, and I have it here listed that he won a super bowl and I believe he was with the Redskins. I, I believe that was right. the case. I think you're right. 
Brian Mitchell, uh, to me, Brian Rick Mitchell is one of the best return of all time. He is, he is, um, if you have a, uh, you know, a Mount Rushmore, he is on there. I, I think I don't disagree with you. He was, uh, a standing back and he was like that, you know, very dangerous on third downs and the offensive side too, you know, cause he was a, a dual threat. He could run pretty well. Uh, and he could catch passes out of the backfield fairly well too. Um, his you know, yardage uh, rushing was you know, just under 2000 yards, but he wasn't, you know, a feature back by any means. He wasn't a, a three down back, but his receiving 255 receptions for over 2,300 yards receiving in his career, you know, in total of 16 touchdowns, 12 rushing four from the pass. So uh, good, good, solid back all around and a good returner. Absolutely. Yeah. I think he's definitely worth a consideration too. So we'll have to come back and check out him too. I think. All right. Uh, who else do you have? No, I'll flip it to you. Okay. I'll well, let, why don't we, why don't we stay with some that. running backs? Cause there's still, I still have a couple, uh, significant ones. How about Mark Van Egan? Uh, probably a little bit before your time, but I can remember him. He was just a, a mean running back uh, for the Oakland Raiders in the seventies. That's sort of those, one of those rivalries that my Steelers had to go against almost every year. It seemed like it was the Oakland Raiders and, uh, Van Egan was just, uh, just had that Ra- Raiders uh, moniker about him. You know, he's just a, a tough, bad guy. You know, everybody dressed the league looked at him as a bl- bad guy. And the R- Raiders just loved that uh, to personify that. But he had 6,651 yards rushing in his career, 37 touchdowns in 136 games, uh, played from 74 through uh, 1981 with the Raiders, and then had a couple years with New England at the end of his career, 82 and 83. Uh, but, you know, solid back, a uh, real, real tough back. Four point yards per carry uh, was his average on that. So, again, not a bad uh, mark there for a running back. I, we, we, we look at uh, – it, it's hard to hold a candle to what Walter Payton, Barry Sanders, and Emmitt Smith did, but – in an NFL career, 6,600 yards is pretty solid. Right. Yeah, especially you had a, a pretty good passing attack. You know, you mentioned Kenny Stabler. He was a quarterback for much of that. Uh, you know, you had Fred Bolitnikoff, uh, another guy from Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, played on that, those teams. Uh, Cliff Branch, uh, Dave Casper at tight end. You know, the Raiders had some good offensive weapons in that era when Van Egan played. So he did not have to produce a lot. He was just sort of a, you know, a guy that carried the ball when they needed him to. Fred Belitnikoff, every time I think of him, I think of the scene from the NFL films where somebody has to put gum in his mouth because he has stick them all over his hand. I just, that's <laughs> every time I think of Fred Belitnikoff, I think of that scene. Oh yeah. The boy, the Raiders, they were, they must've went through a lot of jars of stick them when that was legal. Cause you know, Ugh. Lester Hayes and uh, those guys, uh, I can, I can remember that was a big thing when I was, uh, I was playing uh, probably fifth and sixth grade football. That's when the stick was real big and we were allowed to use it then. So we'd, we'd have stick them, you know, you don't, you always put a little, little swab of stick on the back of your helmet just because the, the pros did it. Of course, it's all like, you know, <laughs> fifth and sixth grade. We're not throwing a lot of passes out there, but Hey, you, you did it. I was a running back. So I had a stick on my hands. It was, it was terrible. It's a terrible thing. It's like having a, a super glue on your hand almost. You, especially on a grass field, as soon as you get tackled, you get up, it looks like you're the straw man. Your hands all full of dead grass, you know. But uh, not a pleasant thing. But hey, it was a, a, a part of football and it was kind of an interesting, fun thing to think about. Uh, it's a different time. Yeah. Uh, a couple other running backs, which I'm not sure. If even uh, I'm not even sure if Van Egan will have consideration, um, but these other two running backs definitely probably won't because Van Egan is a little bit more substantial than them. But uh, Ron Johnson is one of them I like to talk about. He ended up having 4,300 yards, 40 touchdowns, uh, played from 1969 to 1975. So only seven year career uh, came in with Cleveland for a year and then played six years with the giants. But uh Still in seven years to have 40 touchdowns, that's not too bad. No, it isn't. So I thought about mentioning him. And the other one is uh, Mike Rogier. Um, he, you know, great uh, 
player from Nebraska, had a great college career. He had ended up in the NFL, had 4,462 yards, uh, 30 touchdowns. And I don't think uh, they count him when he played for, uh, I think it was the USFL. He USFL. Played. I was actually listening to uh, America's Game by Mike. I cannot think of his name. But I was listening to that today, and they mentioned the USFL. And I was thinking, was that the same Mike Rozier that was on that uh, that played for the USFL? But yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. they they wouldn't have counted that, uh, even though they consider the pros as as he was in the pros. Mike McCambridge, excuse me, I'm I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having issues today. But uh, they mentioned the USFL, and I think he won the Heisman, didn't he? Uh, I think you might be right. I think he did win the Heisman with Nebraska. I want to say that the USFL got Herschel, got Doug Flutie, and they got Mike Rozier. And I think that that's they they pretty much scalped all the uh, Jim Kelly Heisman Trophy winners about three years in a row. Yeah, right. But, you know, they, you know, Jim Kelly and some other great players too that didn't win Heisman's that were great college players. But I wonder why that is that they, the pro football hall of fame, they, they call themselves that purposely so that they, they can cl- include AFL statistics, uh, AFC statistics, mm-hmm. but they don't include them for the USFL. And I don't think they do for the WFL, the, the world football league either, maybe because they only were a couple seasons old. Well, Steve Young would have had a lot better numbers if his numbers were included from the USFL. All right. Uh, I guess another back to talk about, and he's still playing, is Todd Gurley. Um, Todd, Todd has actually more yardage than I thought he did as a pro. Uh, he has had over six, almost 6,100 yards of uh, rushing the ball, 67 touchdowns uh, for Mr. Gurley. And he's only been in the league for six years. So he, he has uh... – for such a young guy, I think his biggest problem was he has arthritis buildup in his knees or his ankles. I'm going to say it's his knees. And my youngest, she's seven years old. She has juvenile arthritis right oh. now, and we're dealing with that. Uh, watching her, she has to take a couple shots a week. Watching her deal with her arthritis, I can't imagine, you know, she's just going about riding at school. You're getting tackled and you're running and you're cutting, I can't imagine what that's like to have arthritis in your knees and having to do that. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize he had that in his knees. I know he's had some leg problems. Like, what do you do, a tear an ACL his uh, senior year in college? Yes. Uh, I remember watching that game. Uh, he was predicted predicted to go pretty high, and he did. But I think his draft stock went down as a result of that. Yeah, that, I mean, he could have been a Heisman winner, I think, that year. That's how good he was. And that was a pretty devastating injury to him. But I'm glad he came back and he's playing at a high level in the pros, though. So that's a good thing. I think uh, last year he was with Atlanta, had uh, f- uh, five years with the Rams, uh, one year in St. Louis and four in L.A. So I, I like Todd Gurley. Um, is he one of our top ten? Uh, you know, he probably will end up with more yards than Terrell Davis. You know, there's a good chance that he could. But who meant more to their team? Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, Todd Gurley playing for the Rams, he, he was he was their team for a couple of years. But for the Falcons, it, it's Julio Jones and Matt Ryan. That's, that's the team right there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And even when he was with the Rams, I mean, he was a significant part of their offense, but he wasn't the, the whole offense. So, you know, they uh, – had some of uh, the, the quarterback and some couple good wide receivers there too. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, that's pretty much who I have, I think for significant uh, running backs. I don't know if we want to get into some, our DBs here. Uh, I have a personal one here. I really like is Jason McCourty. I had the opportunity to see him play. You know, he, he was a Titan uh, for several years. Uh, a very uh, upstanding person, number one, but a very good player, number two. Uh, what I what I look at for defensive backs now is not so much interceptions, but how how willing they are going, how willing they are to go in and hit people. 
for 166 games that Pro Football Reference has him, he has a combined tackle of 723. Now that wow. to me is uh, is amazing. Absolutely. Uh, he, I think he is with the with his brother now, or has been with his brother for the uh, for the past couple of years for the Patriots. They the twins, Devin and Jason. But uh, I've seen Jason play live, and and I tell you what, I was glad he was on our team. Yeah, definitely. I mean, both brothers are great defensive backs, but yeah, I think uh, Jason might be the harder hitter from what I've observed. He definitely uh, brings the wood, you know, to the pile. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, but he he's had eighteen interceptions. That's not too shabby uh, for his career. I think was he like ten years in the league now? I think. Yes. Yes. So that's that's nothing to not too shabby at all. It's almost two interceptions a year. There's a lot of defensive backs that would love to have that. We don't have – I don't think that there's a – well, there might be a couple of shutdown corners, but most of them are get your head down, get into the play, and get out. Right. And Jason McCourty is one of those guys that he's not a shutdown corner or safety, but he is more of a I'm going to stop the play from getting far far ahead of me. I'm going to stop the play there. And you need those. You need those players. Absolutely. You definitely do. I mean, it's not, we uh, talked about, we had the number 24 series uh, when this is airing, it hasn't come on yet. It's actually coming out tomorrow. Uh, but Dana August and I talked about, we had uh, a defensive back Darrell Rivas that uh, only had 29 interceptions, but there was various reasons why he had that. Cause he was such a dominating cover man that quarterbacks stayed away from him. You know, so that's why his numbers were down so far. Uh, they, they threw the other side of the field from uh, Revis. So that doesn't necessarily mean just because you don't have a lot of interceptions from a defensive back. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of a scheme and how good of a cover guy you are because sometimes quarterbacks just don't want to throw in that area. You know, Dana is a good guy. I'm glad you had him on there. He's, he's awesome. Oh, yeah. Why? Wow. Quite the memory on that, that guy, he's he's like, oh, I just let him go. Now, I do have uh, one more I want to throw out. Um, Jamal Williams, okay, Jamal Williams. Now, this guy right here, um, when I was looking him up, I I want to say, let me pull him up again. I want to say that I have seen him play. If it's the one I'm thinking of, if only my phone would want to work. Well, this, but this, I have him listed with 13 sacks, 443 tackles, and he's a three-time Pro Bowler and a two-time All-Pro. So that tells you about how good he is. There must be – is there two Jamal Williams on our number 30 list? Because the Jamal Williams I'm called up as a, was a running back uh, for the, the Packers the last four years. Uh, you know what? I might have just typed in Jamal Williams and picked the, the one – Oh, well, this one was a defensive. Nope. I pulled up the wrong guy. Okay. All right. You know what? Jamal Williams, I'm all about you. You're a good, you're a good player. But he's number 76. So when you get to 76, <laughs> okay. there you go. What <laughs> happens is when start. you go on pro football reference, if you don't pay attention, they're going to pull up more than one Jamal Williams. And I pulled up the wrong one. <laughs> hey, that's easy to do. That's easy to do. Oh, hey, hey, I, I'm, you're already uh, ahead. We already got one in the books for 76. Absolutely. You're already ahead. I'll tell you what, I'm, <laughs> I'm helping out today. Absolutely. Uh, well, I guess uh, running back, it's worth mentioning. He won't be on our list, but uh, Dan Reeves were number 30. You know, we know Dan as a coach, coach the, your Broncos for a long time. Uh, but Dan was a running back with the Dallas Cowboys, had mm -hmm. uh, just under 2,000 yards rushing, 25 touchdowns. Uh, 65 to 72 were the number 30 with the Cowboys. Just uh, drop a name in there because maybe if he you, will be a Hall of Fame coach someday. Who knows? If you ever want to listen to a good story, listen to Dan Reeves talk about the ice bowl. Ah, okay. He's got a, you know, that Southern draw and he's talking about the ice bowl and, and how cold it was. And, and I, I've listened to him talk about that. I want to say that he was involved with the game, like trying to catch passes and he said it hurt. It hurt. It did. But Dan yeah. Reeves and Marty Schottenheimer are two guys that were so close so many times. Dan Reeves nearly won the Super Bowl several times with the Broncos. 
and with the Falcons. And the funny thing is, Dan Reeves got beat by his former team in Super Bowl 33. Well, wasn't wasn't Reeves the one that uh, beat Schottenheimer and uh, like three times in the AFC Championship game? In the a little retribution. I, yeah, I was listening to that <laughs> today too. Uh, you know, the drive, John Elway, the drive, and then the fumble. Ernest Biner got his uh, got a ring though. He did with with the Ravens, but Dan Reeves and Marty Schottenheimer are great coaches. I don't I don't mm-hmm. care what you see. You know, they lost. Super, they're great coaches, both of them, and. Right. Uh, he might not have been a great player, but he is, a, to me, he's a Hall of Famer when it comes to coaching. Yeah, and, you know, uh, Schottenheimer, you know, just had his untimely death uh, only a month or two ago. But, you know, you hear all his former players uh, come out and talk about and people that coached with him, whether they were assistants under him or, you know, served with him when he was an assistant in the league. And you never heard anybody say, anything bad about it. it was all very complimentary of him and it's you know i know uh, schottenheimer was a browns coach and here as steelers fans we're not real fond of you know browns players and uh, coaches but schottenheimer is one that i definitely always respected because he was just a really good coach like you said he had success wherever he went and, i still uh, want to know what he meant when he says there's a gleam folks there's a gleam i i haven't figured that out yet <laughs> i don't know if i heard that one Oh yeah, go look look that up. He he goes up to his team, and I think he was a charger, uh, the Chargers coach at the time, and he says that, and people are looking at him like, "What are you talking about?" But you know, <laughs> maybe you got too much of that California sunshine out there. I've never been out there. One day I might figure that out myself. <laughs> nice place. I've been out there, especially San Diego, L.A. area. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, all right, we got some other DBs here to talk about, though. Okay. Uh, one, one that's kind of interesting, caught my eye, was Benny Parrish. And uh, Benny was a defensive back, uh, 1959 to 1966, again with the Cleveland Browns. And this is a little bit later, uh, Browns era. This would have been part of the Jim Brown era, the Browns. But he had uh, 31 interceptions. Three of those uh, he took to the house. Um you know, that's not a whole lot of stats on defensive backs back then, but those are pretty glaring uh, numbers. His, his first four years in a league, five interceptions, six interceptions, seven interceptions, two interceptions. You know, not too bad. 92-yard uh, interception return for a touchdown and 238 interception yards in one season, which is incredible. Right. Yeah, so I, he, you know what? He should be on consideration just because uh, of the time he played in and and how well he did for those three years that you mentioned. Right, and compared to all of our other defensive backs that were number thirty that I put the stats on, the ones I found significant, he has by far the most interceptions of any of them. Yes, he does. There's one that I do want to bring up: Lebron Landry, Leron Landry, I should say. Hmm. Uh, I remember him coming out of college. I want to say it was LSU. No, it wasn't LSU, um, but I do remember him coming out of college, and there was a big, a lot of buzz about him. And I think his career didn't go out the way he thought it was. But I want to point out he he did have 617 tackles, right? And again, um, to me, if a guy can put his head down from a safety or cornerback position and do those things, he can make my team any day. He had eight sacks in his career too from a DB. That's that's not too bad. Oh, now, you know, Dick LeBeau really brought that in to the uh, to the cornerback, uh, you know, the blitzing, the cornerback or the safeties. And and to me, when you add that together, it's it's awesome. Yeah, it was LSU. I, I was right. Uh, yeah. it, it's just awesome to watch somebody like a Blaine Bishop or uh, somebody I'm familiar with. Blaine Bishop was an incredibly good uh sack master for the Titans. He he knew how to do the quarterback blitz. And LeBron, LeBron Landry was one of those guys that could do that as well. Yeah, d- definitely a, a good defender. And like you said, that's really what his skill set uh, was was doing those blitzes and, you know, tackling the catch. Uh, you know, some, some cornerbacks and safeties are made uh, for that. Some are ball hawks and are, you know, their skill says playing the ball, but LaRon was a you know sure tackler and uh 
they used to sometimes they get some tackles for losses. So that's a, a good weapon to have. He didn't he didn't play very long in the grand scheme of things. I think injuries really got him. But when he was on, that part of the field was pretty much done. Right. Yeah. Um, I really do enjoy. I did I did enjoy watching him play, uh, not so much against my tide, but when he played in the NFL, I really enjoyed him. Yeah, he's definitely a memorable uh, player. I can remember him myself. Now, uh, another defensive back that's worth mentioning, uh, and is just Chad Scott. Uh, you know, Chad Scott uh, played seven years with the Steelers and two years with the the Patriots. Um, he ended up where he wore thirty his whole career. Uh, had twenty one interceptions, four hundred yards returned, four touchdowns on there. Uh, for his career. So, you know, I don't think he'll make the list, but uh, he's definitely significant enough to mention. I don't know if you had anything further on him or not. No, uh, there, there are several of these players that I have stats, but I don't have any recollection of them. And I wish I did. Go, go ahead. If you got one in mind, I do. Uh, Dave Meggett. Oh yeah. Now when I was growing up, um, Dave Meggett was one of those characters, one of those characters. I, I played with him on uh, Take My Ball. I definitely know that much. But he is one of the guys that I remember watching play for the uh, the, the Giants. Uh, and the reason I watch that, because a lot of the games that after two o'clock, when you get the nationwide games, the Giants were the team in the 80s. They were one of the top teams, them and the 49ers, uh, and I remember watching Dave Meggett play. I don't think he was that – he was not a big guy, 5'7", 190. So you think, well, how in the world did he make an NFL roster? Um, if I remember correctly, he was one of the toughest guys on the field. And he's listed with a one-time Super Bowl champion. He did win it with the Giants. Uh, overall, he was one of those guys that uh, – Bill Parcell knew if he needed him in a pinch, there he was. Dave Meggett would do what needed to be done. He was a very solid player. And uh, he's one of those guys that wouldn't have been your every down, every down back. He was just not big enough. But a third down back out of the backfield, even kick returning at times, Dave Meggett was very impressive. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think, but we, we talked a little bit ago about Brian Mitchell with uh, his skill set. I think Dave Meggett was very similar. I mean, uh, punt, punt returns, he had a 10-yard average on his punt returns. He had uh, 3,708 uh, yards returned for 349 returns. Uh, kick returns, 252 of them for f- f- over 5,500 yards. And you know had a, seven touchdowns on punt returns and one in kickoff returns. So those, those are good numbers. And like you said, his offensive performance was, was great too. You know, he uh, ate eight, eight touchdowns, 4.2 yard average rushing the ball, 11 touchdowns. He caught uh, with the nine yards per catch. Those are uh, some great numbers and a, a great uh, guy to have in the backfield uh, when you're getting a little bit of trouble when you're a quarterback. It's a little speed demon almost. I mean, very similar. I think to the way Mitchell played. They're they're very similar built, very similar skills. Uh, Brian Mitchell might have been faster and a little bit more elusive. But if you were playing in the late 80s, early 90s, Dave Meggett wouldn't have been two or three. He would have been, you know, I would want Dave Meggett on my team. Right. Yep, most definitely. That's a good name to mention. I'm glad you, you said him. He was definitely fun to watch. Uh, I have one more, uh, another DB that's worth mentioning, and that's uh, Mike Brown. I don't think we talked about him at all. Uh, Mike uh, played for the Chicago Bears uh, nine years of his 10 and Kansas City one year, but played from uh, 2000 to 2009. And he was an interesting uh, defensive back too. He had 20 interceptions in 116 games. Uh, four of those he returned for touchdowns. Uh, you know, sol- solid player for the Bears. I'm trying to remember him playing. He would have been 
in the Super Bowl that they played in against the Colts. Uh, I guess everybody, any free safety or cornerback would have looked uh, like they didn't exist with Peyton Manning throwing the ball against them. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I can't remember him play. I, I really am drawing a blank on that. Yeah, I don't think he was the the you know the lockdown shutdown corner on that team, but he was a very you know, serviceable court, cornerback and uh, played real well for the the Bears for many years. Well, if you're playing free safety, you're not you're there to to pretty much take care of the middle of a field, and sometimes just don't go over the middle. It may show how good he was that they didn't want to go over the middle. Right. Well, I think we're coming down. Do you have anybody else you want to mention before we uh, start going to our deliberations? Uh, I There's a bunch of people on here, but I think we have pretty much hit the, the highlight reel, including a, a number 76. You know, right. we, we just, that, that's a bonus for today, folks. That's a bonus. You didn't pay for that. There's a gleam. There's a gleam. <laughs> there's your gleam. That's what he was talking about. That's what he's talking about. Okay, well, just to review, we've put four people on our list already of the 10. We have Terrell Davis, Amon Green, Bill Willis, and Clark Hinkle as our yes. first four of uh, 10 that we want to choose here. Now, some people we said we want to come back and talk about, uh, Bill Brown, Lawrence McCutcheon, Ollie Matson, Alex uh, Wojcik, or Wojcicki, I'm sorry I mispronounced the name again, uh, Bernie Parrish. Todd Gurley, Brian Mitchell, and I think that's about it. So how many is that? One, two, three. All right. Well, I, I can see us putting Brian Mitchell in. Okay. I have seven names we said we were going to come back, and we need six of those. So Brian Mitchell, I agree. Uh, hey, if you start an NFL team now and you need a kick returner, Brian Mitchell in his prime would have been uh, – you would go Devin Hester and then Dante Hall, and then you would go Brian Mitchell. I, I but. don't disagree with that. Okay. Um, I would, I'm going to say, I think Mr. Gurley ought to be on there. Cause I think he's one of the, you know, looking at this list, I can't think of uh, somebody that's better him than him at the running back position that we don't already have on the list. Oh, I agree. Let's so, put him in. All right. So that's six players we have on need four more. Uh, see, it's kind of hard for me. Again, we're talking about time. Uh, Ali Matson, to me, for his time, would be our, you know, would be great. If you put him in our time, he would be one of the top running backs. So, okay. I would say Ali Matson. All right. We'll put Ali Matson on. That's seven spots. And I think uh, Lawrence McCutcheon probably ought to be on there, too, you know, with a 4.3 yard average. Oh, yeah. That's a pretty good average. So, that's a very good average. We'll put him in there. So we have two more. And uh, we have Alex, uh, we have Bill Brown, and Bernie Parrish left her meeting. Bernie Parrish was our guy that had 31 interceptions. You know, Alex was a, a center and a linebacker, had a had some interceptions himself from that uh, spot. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking maybe Alex ought to be in there because that – I think Alex should be in there. Right. I think so too. So that uh, gets all of our Hall of Famers on our list. Absolutely. And we have they're, one they're in more. the Hall of Fame for a reason. One more between uh, Bill Brown, the running back that had 5,800 yards and 52 touchdowns, and Bernie Parrish, who had uh, 31 interceptions in an era where they didn't pass that much. I think it's got to probably go to the DB with 31 interceptions. I, I think I'm, I'm with you. We're going to sell boom, boom jerseys, but Bernie Parrish <laughs> should be our last player. I, I totally agree. Okay, and in no particular order, our 10 choices are Brian Mitchell, Todd Gurley, uh, Boom Boom Bernie Parrish, uh, Alex, well, I'm not going to try to say his last name, I'll butcher it again, Clark Hinkle, Bill Willis, Ollie Matson, Lawrence McCutcheon, Amon Green, and Terrell Davis. I think we did it. I think we did it. Yeah, I think uh, I'm pretty satisfied with that. Now, before I let you go, and I greatly appreciate you joining us, what do you have uh, coming up that we can look forward to on the Football's Family podcast? Well, I have a list of 10 things that I'm planning on doing in the next 10 weeks. But the big thing is this coming uh, Thursday, I'm doing my uh, Why I Like the Titans. I'm just going to 
go ahead and write my love sonnet for them. If I was, you know, William Shakespeare, this would be a sonnet. Then I'm going to talk about the 1999 uh, Titans. Then I'm going to have a guest come on uh, to talk about the 80s Browns. And I'm working on getting uh, getting some feelers out to some local high school and college coaches in this area. But I might also throw a change up in there. I'm going to reach out to the basketball coach or a couple of them. I get them both on of the college I attended. We're going to have footballers family, the basketball edition. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's that family part, but then I'm working with somebody here that we're going to start writing articles as soon as we can figure out what we want to do with it about the Super Bowl rings. Yeah, that's that is definitely a great project that I'm glad you brought up and brought me into. I th- I'm excited about that. Uh, you know, when the one thing is, uh, I, there's a line from draft day. Why is it that the most burly men in the world want to fight for a ring? Well, guess what? They're beautiful. <laughs> yes, they are. And and speaking of which, I'm going to do a review on the book, on the movie draft day. Okay. <clears throat> so if, if you would like to join in, you know, y- your homework would be to watch the movie draft day. <laughs> That's a great movie. It is a very good movie. Really, really big twist at the end. We're not going to give it away, but I, I'll tell you this. There will be spoilers in that podcast, so just be ready. <laughs> but there will be. You got you to talk about the end if you're talking about the movie. Absolutely. It's, it's uh, the best part. And, and I got a good question to throw out there is how does Draft Day and the Superman franchise, what do they have in common? Draft day in the Superman franchise. Just, just mm. a spoil. No spoiler. This is, this is, this is intense questioning right now. You're going to be a cliff. It's good cliffhanger till that comes out. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I don't know. I'll have to wait to listen to your podcast to find out. I guess, huh? Well, I guess, I guess we should. I tell you what, Darren. <laughs> I appreciate you letting me come on. It's always a pleasure, my friend. Well, we, we greatly appreciate you be spending your time with us and uh, doing this research and talking about these great players that were the number 30 and come up with these lists with us. And uh, I think we have you on for some more down the road here. So, and if not, we, we got to get you signed on to some more because enjoy having your company. Hey, it's, 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 it's my pleasure, my friend. And, and y'all like, and, and subscribe to this podcast. This is one of the, my favorite podcasts on uh, every day you listen to it, you get something new and you get positive reinforcement in a world that is negative. You need the positive and Darren will deliver. Well, thank you. That's kind words. And make sure you check out that uh, football's family podcast every Thursday. You're, you're on with that. Uh, Lord willing. Yes. Now okay. I, I do want to hear something from you before I leave. Okay. Can you give us a tighten up? Oh, I don't know if I, I can do that. Oh, Darren, you're killing me. <laughs> uh, I'd have to, I'd have to, I'd be selling out my Steeler dumb. You know, they'd kick me out of Steeler Nation if I did that. <laughs> oh, but anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you. What an honor it was to have Jeremy McFarlane on once again to talk about the greatest number 30s in NFL history. He's been a couple of our other Football by Numbers series podcasts, and uh, he's always an interesting uh, talk there because he has a lot of football knowledge in his head. And if you see or hear anything that we may have missed, any players number 30 that we may have missed, or maybe you have a better suggestion for our top 10, please email us at pigskindispatch at gmail.com, and we'll make sure in a future episode to make any corrections uh, that we see fit after doing some investigation from your numbers. So thanks for joining us, folks. We're glad you enjoyed it. Tune in tomorrow for your football history headlines. And next week, we'll get back into our football by numbers with the number 31s. Joe Ziemba joins us and Joe Zagorski and uh, more Joe Ziemba. Lots of Joes and letter Z's as a last name coming up on your football by numbers and lots of football history. So till tomorrow, everybody, have a great gridiron day. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast.
This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876 including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com ROW number one for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.